Hello, hello, everybody. And good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening, I guess. I see people connecting. We have, yeah, more and more people getting uh, connecting. So first of all, let me start by uh, saying thanks. Thanks for joining us today. And in this uh, webinar, as you can see here in the title, uh, we are talking about uh, coffee today. Uh, compostable coffee pod uh, and performance uh, made uh, with ING. And I'm not alone, uh, likely, and I'm actually today with uh, Donovan and uh, Joshua. So before uh, we start uh, talking, and we want today's discussion to be as interactive as possible, I will quickly uh, introduce Donovan and Joshua and myself. So. Uh, Donovan has uh, been with NatureWorks now for over 25 years. He is an, an application development engineer and with uh, wide experience developing products and processes uh, with uh, polylactic acid resins. Um, Joshua, on his hand, is a senior scientist and is responsible now for leading and contributing to R&D projects such as uh, single-serve beverages, the topic we're talking about today. And Joshua is also specialized in uh, areas like rheological characterization, extrusion, and thermoforming technology and mathematical modeling. So, and then uh, it's me, it's Flavio. Uh, I've been with NatureWorks now for uh, over seven years. Uh, and in the last years, I've been really focusing on the single serve beverage uh, market, uh, leading the strategic effort that NatureWorks has been uh, putting into, into this market. Uh, so with that, um, I will start uh, talking during the next uh, probably 10 minutes, and then I will leave uh, uh, first Donovan and then Joshua to, to speak. Uh, I want to just just before I start, uh, I want to let you know that uh, we will distribute a copy of this uh, presentation. So feel free to take note, but we'll make sure you get a PDF copy of the presentation. And what is also very important is uh, you will see on uh, your um, right hand side a tab uh, where you can uh, type your questions. So please feel free and don't be afraid to ask questions. We will. Uh, have time at the end of the of the presentation uh, for a Q and A session. We will we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So please uh, ask your question again. And let's make sure this is a, a, an interactive uh, session. So uh, if Josh, you can please go to the first slide. I will start quickly and really quickly. Uh, I. Again, you will have this slide, so I'm not going to spend much time here, but I think it's important for uh, the audience to know that uh, NatureWorks has been uh, making, uh, performing uh, NGO polymers for the last uh, 30 years, so since 1989, when, when we had this crazy idea of turning uh, greenhouse gases into carbon dioxide, sorry, into, into products. like, And we have a plant, uh, one of the biggest plants worldwide making uh, the NGO PLA in uh, Blair, Nebraska. Uh, and uh, we hit back in 2017, uh, 2 billion uh, pounds uh, milestone produced since the, the plant was operating. Uh, next slide, please, Joshua. Uh, so, yeah, I, you saw that the one before, but you will uh, hear us talking about NGO. Again, this is the the name of a portfolio of performing uh, biopolymer. Uh, and uh, these biopolymers today are widely used in very different markets. You can see here uh, some of the markets where uh, NGO is used and, uh, by our partners. And you can find most of these products on uh, on shelves. And again, this uh, if I were to show you this uh, picture only three years ago, it would have been uh, pretty much different. And when I see different, for example, and again, uh, I think about also coffee, which for NatureWorks is a relatively new market, uh, it's really expanding. And so, as I was saying today, we are going to be focusing on one of the markets where NatureWorks has been operating. Next, please. So preparing today's presentation and again, thinking about uh, how to uh, better 
create the basis for the discussion, I I thought about Googling uh, and uh, I was looking uh, where and when uh, plastic was created. So you can find different uh, pieces of information on the, on the internet, but one I like was coming from Plastic Europe saying that it was invented by Belgian-American chemist called Leo Beckland. And of course he created a plastic called Beckelite. Uh, or yeah, pretty more complex name that you can see here on the screen. Um, so this was back in 1907. And then if we move to the next slide, you will see that since then, so we're talking about more than 100 years, the plastic, uh, the polymers have been developing with one idea in mind, which was performance. And so uh, reaching and expanding the desirable properties that uh, plastic polymers uh, should have had in order to meet the, the requirements and your new requirements that the, the industry was asking for. And so the desirable pr properties, also known as performance, has always been the main driver to make uh, new polymers. Uh, next slide, please. And why I'm showing this slide here is because, you know, the focus has always been for many years only performance. And so when those new polymers were created, the question was not about, uh, you know, what is the desired end of life, what we will be, be doing once the this the product will uh, come to the end of uh, of uh, its life, and so because of that focus on performance, uh, the industry was focusing less on the environmental impact. And I'm just showing here, uh, you know, the, some numbers coming from The Guardian, you know, I, I could show plenty of different slides, but this is not the point. The point again was for me is to make, to understand that the, the focus has always been performance till the last uh, few years where we started switching from performance to uh, environmental friendly uh, packaging and polymers. Uh, next slide, please. With bioplastic, so trying to make a comparison between uh, plastics and bioplastics, it's been quite the opposite. They were invented with a clear focus in mind, which was the fact that they were renewable sources, so coming from a biosource, from renewable sources, as I said, and also having in mind uh, the end of life, so creating a new end of life for packaging, which we call organic recycling or compostability. Uh, and so again, you can see the focus, the different uh, starting point from plastic to bioplastic. Next slide, please. Which in the case of bioplastic also resulted in having a, a very well structured certifications that you can see here, some example on the left hand side, and then a less structured uh, claims that uh, brands be using. And here I'm just using some that are probably not 100% correct, but just to show you that the idea and the main reason again to use and to implement uh, bioplastic for many years was the fact that they were uh, more eco-friendly, more sustainable. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, also bioplastic, same as for plastic, uh, received some criticism. And in this case, you can see it just again, I took a screenshot from the internet where uh, one of the criticism was for bioplastic was that there there is still a long road to high performance to making sure that bioplastic could perform at least in line as with incumbent uh, material. Uh, next slide. And so it's kind of, it's been always a trade-off between performance and sustainability. Again, I'm not uh, telling you anything new uh, with this slide, but I think it's important important to see how from both sides, so both from the plastic side and from the bioplastic side, there's been a need, a willingness to um, try to move the performance side and the sustainability side closer. So, and we all know all the effort that the plastic industry is making to, to be more sustainable. And, and I will, we will show today how uh, bioplastics and how NGO and how NatureWorks has been investing time uh, to make sure that uh, our products uh, are performing. So next slide, please. So what you saw in uh, with plastic is very similar with what you have been observing in coffee, because again, today we're talking about coffee pods. So with coffee pods and specifically talking about uh, North America, you you know, you all know that uh, it all started with some uh, PSEVOHPP uh, pods. And the reason why this material was chosen was not because uh, it was easier to be recycled, actually quite the opposite, but because it was easier 
to be thermoformed and molded. So again, performance in mind, properties in mind. End of life was not a big concern at that time. Uh, today, uh, we have big brands that actually uh, said that by the end of the year, so we have another three months, they will completely switch to a polypropylene EDOH, polypropylene capsule, meaning that what used to be the standard for the industry, so the PS EVOH PP pods, is today not any longer the standard. Actually, it's disappearing completely from the market. So you can see how the industry is able to, to really develop new solutions to try to meet today's uh, needs. Uh, and so what is... Uh, happening today with the PPDH uh, polypropylene according uh, to us is that of course it's it's more challenging from a, a performance point of view when it comes for example to molding and forming but it gives that attribute like monomaterial so consumers today can uh, have an easier task when they want to make sure that that pods end up uh, in the recycle bin but they still have to for example to separate the parts and what's happening? And so, sorry, this first part took 20 years to switch from PS to PP. And what we observe now, and you can see on the news, there are more and more uh, new product launches that are uh, where bio resins are used for uh, coffee pots. And again, from a properties point of view, molding and forming them is challenging, and it requires uh, sometimes adapting lines and having the right uh, knowledge and having a supply chain that is uh, capable of uh, getting the most out of them. Uh, but they bring that renewable and compostable uh, attribute that was missing before, meaning that now there is no burden for the consumer and there is no need to separate all the different parts because you have what is uh, the most important contents of the of the pods, coffee, which is uh, in some cases up to 90% total weight of the of the capsule of the pod. Sorry. So now you are the consumer has an easier task to be able to really make sure that the end of life of these pods is uh, is easier. So if we move to the next slide, please. Here I'm quickly showing and it's a linking and then leaving uh, Donovan and Joshua to talk. I just wanted to show with these slides and uh, I know that Donovan and Joshua will highlight this with more details, how NGO is today used in uh, a different formats that are a the typical format using single serve beverages. You see a tea bag, a soft coffee pot, and then all the different uh, uh, formats that you can find both in high and low pressure system uh, in, uh, in, in Europe and North America. Uh, next slide, please. And again, I said now because it's real, it's happening now. It's not something that, you know, it's not a development. You see already in Europe, for example, I'm just putting here a picture of a new development, new launch, a product launch that is that happened last year. So there are plenty of new uh, NGO based pods on store shelves today available in the market. Next slide. And so we really think that today and uh, it is possible to have a performing coffee pot which is also sustainable and the way we look at sustainability i think it's clear it's making sure that compostability is uh, the packaging is compostable as well as the coffee and so making this job easier in terms of end of life uh, next slide please so yeah thanks and with this sorry i just want to as i was saying to create uh, the the right level for uh, Donovan to start and next slide please Joshua because we will be talking in a in the next so Donovan and Joshua will be talking about uh, how we manage to put together all the different elements that are required to have a food safe uh, good taste uh, and performing uh, pods. So you have in this uh, slide all together the different elements that are required so you will and with these goals in mind, we developed uh, NGO grades that are, for example, resistant to heat and to pressure. And we modified the NGO grades that are now specifically developed for this market to make sure that uh, you get the ideal cup of coffee, making sure that, for example, you have a, a right balance of mechanical properties to, to have a consistent puncture. So again, and I could spend a few minutes on this slide, but I just want to make sure that there's been a work specific to the requirements of the coffee pot markets. Next slide, please. And this is really my last slide, which was the one I showed in before, just adding here that, and looking at this as a bigger picture, you have 
as I was saying before, different elements. You have leading filters and what we call the body capsule the, or the, of the body of the pods. So today we will be focusing our attention on the body and on the filter. We will be touching also the leading structure in a later stage. We want today to give you really good overview of the fiber and of the rigid structure. And so with this, I will leave to you, Donovan, uh, the, to, to introduce uh, the, the fiber piece and then to Joshua. And uh, I will be back later on for all your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Flavio. Uh, I'm Donovan Kirschbaum. And this next section, we will be discussing the fiber media that goes into the capsule for the uh, coffee filtration side of it. Next. So there's primarily three different routes to, to uh, produce a fabric used for coffee capsules in the filtration space. The first one is a, a wet laid non-woven product. The second one is a spun bond non-woven product. And there is a third uh, a fabric, a woven fabric that is also used, but that's a fairly small market, niche market. So uh, today we're gonna leave that, that one off the table and discuss more in detail on the wet laid and the spun bond uh, materials that go into the uh, coffee filter. We personally don't have a preference. Uh, customers really make their own decisions there based on, it could be the type of equipment that they're running, it could be their relationships they, they currently have or their supply chain. So we, we don't really prefer or make a preference on one versus another, but we work in, in both the spaces. Next. So starting off with wet laid. So what is a wet laid? So wet laid in its basic format is a, is a paper and cellulose fibers such as Abaca are uh, used fairly often in this space to produce a paper like substrate that's used as a filtration product that uh, works well with, with coffee and tea basically. And if you look at the top right hand picture, that's your most basic form of a wet laid filter. That one's pretty much 100% cellulosic fibers. So if you look at the next two down, if, if you need to produce some type of a filtration system that has to be either heat sealed uh, or ultrasonically bonded, you need to add a certain percentage of a thermoplastic fiber into that matrix while you're making the paper. And in the past, that was typically a polypropylene type fiber at around a 30% in the matrix. So a few years back, there was a, a desire to produce a more bio-based compostable structure for the, the tea market. So at NatureWorks, we started working on replacing that polypropylene with an NGO-based uh, compostable type fiber in that matrix. And with that, we're able to produce uh, fibers and have tea bags uh, on the market globally today. And what that's allowed us to do is transition fairly easily into the coffee space with a similar type of a product. Next. So what do we do at NatureWorks in this area? So we, we internally have a state-of-the-art pilot fiber spinning line with the capability of producing a lot of different materials from fiber deniers, shapes, bi-components, et cetera. Uh, I may look like I'm 25 from the video, but I was spinning and drawing fibers back in the mid 90s. So, so we have a fair amount of uh, experience in house in the process of producing fibers. Uh, we can engineer those fibers to meet the different requirements for different filtration needs. However, we we are not paper manufacturers, we're not experts in, in making paper. So we, 
we typically will collaborate with universities and paper suppliers to help develop the products that actually are used into the market. So next. So what's a critical criteria for a shortcut fiber that goes into the wet laid process? The first thing is fiber morphology. We have to optimize the polymer melt temperature and the thermal characteristics as in shrinkage in order to produce a good seal for those components going into the capsule. Secondly, the ability to, uh, the fiber diameter and the cut length are critical. And what that's utilizing is maximizing the, the more fiber you can, surface area that you can have with fiber in the finished product on the wet laid, it, it improves your ability to seal that product and give you wet, give, give you good seal strength uh, without putting more fiber in than you actually need. And then lastly, but as critical as far as importance goes is, is fiber dispersion. And this is a critical element because you need to be able to disperse those fibers in with the cellulosic matrix prior to uh, that material being laid down onto the belt, producing the paper-like fabrics used in the uh, filtration process. If, if those fibers aren't distributed evenly, you'll have areas that will seal extremely well and areas that will have a difficult time or zero sealing. So that it's, a, and it's extremely critical for dispersion. And, and the glass on the right hand picture, that is actually a very poorly dispersed fiber. If, if that was dispersed well, you wouldn't be able to see the fiber in that matrix. It would just be a slightly cloudy matrix, but uh, for show purposes, you wouldn't be able to tell if they were evenly distributed. So, so those are the three critical criteria that drives uh, fibers that go into the wet laid market. Next. So next is spun bond. Spun bond is a totally different process and then a, then a wet laid process. Spun bonds are typically 100% polymer based. They're produced through an extrusion process where you, you put polymer into an extruder through a spin block, through a spinneret, and then using high speed air uh, they which draws the fibers onto the collector belt. So it's a totally different continuous process than a wet laid process. And then once the fibers are laid down on the bet, belt, they typically go through a calendar. And, and that's usually some type of a point bond calendar. And once they're wound up onto rolls, that fabric is now ready for use. However, these, these lines are extremely large. So it Typical commercial line can have three to seven thousand holes per meter in the spinneret, and could be three to five meters wide. So, so it's very important doing the development work on these lines that you get all your ducks in a row uh, prior to getting on these lines because they they can burn through a lot of material and and a lot of time in a hurry. NGO resins run well on conventional spun bond lines as long as they're designed for high filament velocities. And, and that's very critical. And we will, I'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, so next. So similar to wet laid, we have a lot of experience in-house developing uh, fibers and what is needed for the fiber market as far as the filtration media in a spun bond. We don't have the capability to make an actual web. So what we do in-house is we have what's called a lurgy gun, and it's a high-speed aspirator that we connect to our pilot spinning system. And what that allows us to do is mimic what you would see on a conventional spun bond draw line. And what with that, we can look at how well 
fibers spin, what they look like coming out of the spinneret. Are you getting drips? Is it stable? We can look at fiber tenacity. We can look at crystallinity. We can look at the thermal properties. Are we getting high shrinkage or low shrinkage? So the key, the key to getting low shrinkage in, and I mentioned this a little bit in the other slide, was you need high filament velocity to promote the stress-induced crystallinity in a spun bond uh, material. So if you look at the chart on the right, we have two different polymers, angiopolymers. And polymer A has very poor thermal characteristics, even at higher spinning speeds. However, that resin could be a good heat sealing resin, for example. So then you look at polymer B, and that's got very good thermal characteristics. The boiling water shrinkage, for example, is very low. And that, however, that resin may not be the ideal resin for heat sealing, for example. So now with the use of things like bicomponents, we can put resin B in the core and resin A on the sheath and have the best of both worlds. So, so we're able to tailor fibers for specific needs prior to, to uh, scaling anything. And another key component is, if you look at the, the little table on the left, is polypropylene, for example, doesn't need as high a filament velocity to produce a, a stable, thermally stable fiber as you would for, for a PLA and a PET, for example. And so this becomes critical when you're working with customers that are going to produce spun bond and if they've got the right assets. The older R3 Reifenhauser, for example, type lines have a difficult time uh, producing PLA fabrics uh, that have good uh, thermal stability and spinability. So next. So unlike the wet laid where we can typically go from a pilot facility to scaling that, with spun bond, we take a second step. We like to ensure that things are going to, to run on a line that produces actual fabric. So we go to external facilities that have spun bond lines, like uh, our friends at Nonwovens Institute in North Carolina. They've got a one meter wide uh, new R4 line. Uh, STFI in Germany, they also have a one meter wide R4 line. And then SETI in France has a half meter wide uh, line. So depending on what our needs are, we'll typically do a lot of work in-house to develop uh, and feel comfortable about the spinning and characterization of the fibers. And then we will typically uh, go to the next step prior to going on those big lines. Because like I said, the big lines, you want to make sure uh, things are ready to roll before you tackle that. So that's that's the end of it for me. And now Joshua is going to explain all the great things that are happening in the capsule space at NatureWorks. Great, thank you, Donovan. So as Donovan mentioned, you know we we focus on characterizing and optimizing material going into each component of the system. Uh, and really trying to build a basis uh, for the roasters and the brands to collect that in a system that results in a great consumer experience. So for the next part of the discussion, we're going to talk particularly about the, the rigid bodies themselves um, and how that contributes to that consumer experience and, and ways that we have found to really investigate and characterize that. So the first thing that immediately comes to mind when we start talking about consumer experience and the taste experience uh, from coffee is, of course, the coffee itself and, and how it's ground, the roaster it's coming from, uh, et cetera. The role of the packaging is to effectively play no role at all in, in that taste, in that flavor of the coffee. Uh, and so one way that that we can do that is really 
by minimizing any transmission of, in this case, oxygen from the coffee, from the inside of the pod um, to, of course, the environment. Certainly, uh, as you know, Flavio had mentioned earlier, earlier iterations included using a barrier layer such as EVOH with polystyrene and polypropylene. Really the leading barrier option to date commercially for compostable products, for these sustainable products is, um, comes from Nippon Gosai as a G polymer. And so we wanted to emphasize the ability for NGO to be compatible with this material, uh, run smoothly and consistently with the material uh, to end up with that final result of a very minimal oxygen transmission. And so what you've seen here is, is what we've taken is our NGO sheath and tying it together with that barrier layer. And you can see in the image uh, on that graph of really a very nice uniform distribution of the layers. This is a critical aspect when you're thinking about uh, long shelf life and, and minimal oxygen transmission uh, is really having nice uh, stable uniform layers and so you see here the two tie layers surrounding the barrier layer and then of course the larger NGO sheath on top and then the graph itself is really um, showing a quantifiable measurement uh, these are typically taken and I believe this one as well from a MoCon uh, permeation analyzer to really look at how much oxygen is actually transmitting through this material amazingly enough uh, at higher temperatures uh, really this NGO system with G polymer can actually outperform uh, incumbent EVOH systems uh, in reducing that oxygen uh, from transmitting through. Of course, we're talking about taste experience, we're talking about consumer experience. Uh, unfortunately, not nearly enough of our consumers have MoCon permeation analyzers uh, in their home to really appreciate how great of a system and a technology that, uh, that we've developed with our partners here. Um, so the next step is to really try to quantify that through organoleptic testing. NatureWorks has partnered uh, with uh, one of our customers, Flo here, uh, in partnership with um, train, highly trained organoleptic testing uh, folks to, to really nail down the, the variables, the sensory variables that our consumers are experiencing. Um, and what you see on this graph is a rating on the, the y-axis is a rating from zero to 10 uh, of the strength of each of those variables. These vari this panel comes back again and again over time. Uh, and you can see here the different colors and lines are, are different uh, uh, time points at which this panel is evaluating the strength of each of these variables. Ideally, in a perfect world, we're seeing one line across this whole graph, right? Um, but there is some variability, uh, data point to data point. Um, but what we want to emphasize here is really what is the variance? And we're going to quantify that variance over time. Uh, and here we're seeing a, a, a plus or minus one to maybe two points, uh, depending on the variable throughout. And that's really an indicator of an excellent product that is um, maintaining that consistent taste experience uh, for that consumer. In addition to the, the taste uh, and, and that consistency for that consumer, we also need to make sure that the, the mechanical integrity uh, is maintained for those products. So I'm going to show you a couple ways that we look at this and, and the uh, looking at both mechanical uh, material characterization uh, as well as final product um, solutions and, and testing. So you can notice on the uh, left graph here, uh, which is a rheology curve, what we're looking at is the stiffness of that product, the stiffness of that plastic, um, of various plastics. And I've, I've narrowed down a uh, a brewing temperature plus or minus 10 degrees here. So we're at 90, brewing tends to stay just under 100 C, but I've, I've included this range up to 110 so you can really appreciate that window. And you'll notice the pink curve or, or magenta curve is polystyrene. And you'll notice that it's actually quite stiff, uh, even up to brewing temperatures. It transitions right at about 100 C, so right near the brewing temperature. And you can see it's actually quite, quite stiff here. Um, and then we'll reduce in that stiffness as 
as and if that brewing uh, gets too hot. The transition uh, recently uh, in the industry has moved to polypropylene. Polypropylene offers some advantages here where it is very stable across uh, this temperature window uh, in terms of its stiffness. However, it is, it is softer than that polystyrene was, um, particularly close to 90 degrees. Then we can overlay here with NGO. The amorphous resin NGO transitions closer to about 60 C and of course would be much too weak for this uh, application. And so what we do then is fully crystallize the product. A fully crystalline product, as you can see here, the orange uh, line really overlays very well with polypropylene. So the stiffness, uh, as you're thinking about the design of your product, the stiffness of NGO when it is fully crystalline is really uh, quite identical to the stiffness of polypropylene and you're taking this into account, how you're doing your geometry, how you're managing material distribution, things of that nature. The right graph uh, is um, really discusses the tunability of impact strength. So here our x-axis is increasing uh, loadings of, let's say, an impact modifier that you might want to add in. The y-axis, um, the impact strength. I've just posted for just relative incumbency, uh, HIPS value, ABS value, so you can get a feel for the stiffness of other polymers. But really what I want to emphasize here is the tunability, particularly of NGO, to match that impact strength that's needed. The green curve is amorphous, uh, version of 4032, one of our crystallizable resins. And you can see that over time, increasing impact modifier loading will increase that impact strength. The purple curve is our crystallized resin. And you can see that there is now a dramatic increase in impact strength. That crystallinity interacts with the impact modifier uh, and we're able to then tune exactly where we need that. What I'm showing on the bottom are images of, of pods that we've produced in-house uh, and really to emphasize the very different uh, reactions to these material characteristics. So if you look at the capsule on the far left, you can see that it's buckled, uh, that it's shrunk to some extent, um, and this is tuning that crystallinity uh, and tuning the material distribution. Um, and, and this is a, a case where that, that was done poorly. There was not nearly enough crystallinity uh, to manage that. Okay, As we go forward, forward, if you look at, let's say, the capsule number three there, I think it's got a four on it uh, on the sample uh, number, you can see a very slight indentation. In this case, the puncture, the force required by that consumer to puncture, it was too much. They, they, there, you couldn't puncture the capsule all the way, and it results in uh, deforming the bottom of the capsule. So here we have a scenario where the impact is much, impact strength is much too high, uh, and this has a direct uh, relation to the consumer experience, especially in the case of North America and these low pressure systems. Uh, the consumer directly feels um, the the puncture and the force takes uh, takes to puncture, uh, depending on the brewing system used. Uh, and so here in this case, optimizing that, that impact is, is very critical. So if we go over to the images on the right and we see these white capsules, um, the one on the left, here's a case where we're able to puncture, we're able to get through the capsule, but the cracking that forms uh, is going to have a very different effect in your water flow. So the flow that's coming through and then the coffee brewing into the cup um, could potentially spray, potentially have uh, some drawbacks for that consumer. What you're looking for and you're optimizing for is that far right capsule where you see a nice clean puncture. Uh, we've, we've balanced the crystallinity with the impact strength uh, and managed to meet that product specification for that consumer experience. One mechanism, uh, and I want to talk very specifically about a test that we perform in-house um, to, to define a processing window uh, for the conversion step. So this is going to be a bit more detailed, but I really want to uh, show how you can really think about uh, characterizing material to help reduce the scope of time it takes to optimize your conversion process. I'm talking about thermoforming here in particular. Of course, uh, something similar can be done for injection molding, et cetera. But here in thermoforming, um, we use a, a test method that we call a hot tensile test. And effectively what we're gonna do here is we're going to pull on a sample 
of the polymer formulated based on uh, the balancing act that needed to be done in the previous slide. Uh, and we're going to stretch it to the, the stretching ratio required in the thermoforming process. So you can see on the far left image, the, a sample um, that has yet to be stretched. Then the middle uh, picture, you can see that sample is starting to be stretched. You see a necking in, uh, it's starting to get thinner, exactly how we'd expect when we're drawing into a pod. And then the, the far right picture um, stretched extravagantly, much more actually than we would see in the pod, and, and some discoloration occurs, some stress whitening. Uh, this is true for, for many polymers, that you'll experience the stress whitening or discoloration at very high stress concentrations. On the right-hand side is a, a graph um, that you might reproduce uh, in order to find your processing window. So you can see uh, right away on the far left, so here the x-axis is temperature, so we're cool on the right side, we're hot on the, uh, we're cool on the left side, we're hot on the right side, and then the y-axis is a, a stress measurement, okay? So when we're too cold, that stress is very high and we result with very uh, with a discoloration, with stress whitening. You can see this in, in, in some products in the marketplace where uh, in the, the depth of a capsule or a, a meat tray or something similar, a cup, um, where you can actually see a discoloration in the stretched region, right? So in this case, overstretching, high stress can result in that discoloration and, and uh, you know, not acceptable for uh, for that consumer uh, look, looking visually at the capsule. The other constraint is the far end. Too high, and now we have um, crystallization occurring too quickly. Here you'll notice the stress didn't get too high, and the reason for that is uh, if you see that sort of ball that, that formed in the middle, that was a highly crystallized region, didn't stretch at all, really stayed, maintained its thickness. The very thin areas that wasn't crystallized, that's what got stretched and got stretched an over amount. So in this case, you'll notice in your pod, um, really thick regions and very thin regions, that's gonna result in the buckling you saw, for instance, earlier in the slide before. Finally, we find our processing window. In this processing window, we've, we've stretched to the extent that's necessary to fill the mold, to fill the part without the discoloration coming from either the stress whitening or over crystallizing. Our next step here then is to scale. And to scale uh, these new process improvements really done on a, on a pilot scale thermoformer, um, which is it, it, an excellent way for us to engage uh, with folks in the supply chain, in, converters in the supply chain, and even, uh, even the, the brand owners this is the time for us to really collaborate and identify how the changes we've made to the variables before come together and, and convert into, into the final product. We use and, and highly recommend you know, a, a Kefal thermoformer uh, that we have in-house. It's very customizable. We can change the temperature of the oven, very granular change of the temperature of the oven, changing the temperature of the tools, the forming air, et cetera. Um, but really at the end of the day, I really find this to be a valuable tool and recommend it uh, to bring folks in, to bring uh, folks in the supply chain together to watch how all these different process improvements and formulation improvements uh, come together in that final part. Lastly, I'm gonna talk briefly in another mechanism to accelerate that product development is really with predictive modeling. Here at NatureWorks, we use uh, a combination of finite element analysis, as well as some proprietary in-house modeling software that we've developed uh, to simulate both the conversion processes and the final product performance. It's really critical that you, you get both of these and, and that you're working at both of them together uh, as they're really going to influence each other you're going to be able to pull uh, the conversion process simulation and utilize that as an input for your product, uh, final product performance simulation. And then at the end of the day, this reduces your costly iterations of mold development, uh, cavity development, particularly if you're skipping that pilot scale thermoforming stage, these molds can get extremely expensive and costly uh, and, and just delay your final timeline depending on the turnaround of those molds. We have found at NatureWorks that, that a lot of finite element analysis packages 
are not sufficient, particularly for thermoforming on their own, do require some uh, advanced um, additions, uh, algorithms, mechanical uh, material models to be added in. Uh, NatureWorks is de has developed a capability in-house to do that, um, and, and we highly recommend matching those advanced material models to get to this predictive state. You can see on the left side uh, that's looping here. This is using SOLIDWORKS again with some in-house modification uh, to form that capsule. So this is an NGO product using NGO material modeling to show it filling out that mold. And as we talked about before, material distribution is so critical here. And you, you can see through the colors how that material, uh, the colors are showing the, the strain, so the thickness uh, that's changing as it's moving through and the deformation and consistent uh, with what you might expect, thick on the top, uh, starting to get thinner in the bottom in that red area, it's particularly near the corner. And then actually, we can't quite see from this angle, but the very center of the bottom, that area is actually thicker. And so you can see at the end, a little bit of the slightly orange color, a little bit thick, uh, thicker than, than on the end. This is one way that we use this from a product development standpoint, is what is gonna to happen to the caps or to the pod, to that rigid body during the brewing process. So we can take the output of this model um, from the process, conversion process and use it as our input into the final product. And you can see um, right here a before image uh, where, you know what? A pod that had an improper material distribution was not able to withstand the compressive forces particularly puncture forces, et cetera, in the brewing machine and cause a buckling. And you can see that we were able to predict even the location of where that would buckle. Of course, the stress concentration is in that thin area. Then redo our simulation, in which case that's the, uh, the distribution is, is more consistent, a bit more uniform. Once we've understood the right starting sheet thickness, the right material distribution necessary, maybe that means a plug change or a uh, change to the material of the plug or the geometry of the plug, you end up with a capsule that has, has completely withstood the brewing process and, and no uh, significant change. So to summarize, at the end of the day, we want to design a compostable pod that meets the performance specifications, that has a, an excellent consumer experience. And there are a lot of components that drive to that, that um, include balancing the mechanical properties, having a, a high heat and high pressure resistance, um, and, and then, of course, the barrier properties that are going to maintain that consistent uh, flavor through the course of its shelf life. With that, I'd really like to thank you all for attending this webinar, uh, for, for participating with us and, and thinking through ways that we can optimize performance of a compostable pod, having a both and of performance and sustainability. So at this time, we'd like to open the floor. I see some of you have already added questions um, to the tab uh, and we'd like to start a Q&A session here. Yeah, well, thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Donovan, thanks, Joshua. Uh, we are well on time, and yes, as you just you were saying, I'm really glad that people are asking questions. So, as I was saying at the beginning, please don't be shy, and I will we will start now uh, answering as many as we can. Uh, before doing that, uh, before I forget, um, one thing that I want to let you know is that we will post a video of today's webinar on YouTube, and so please follow us also on uh, social medias because you will find. Uh, basically daily posts uh, about activities that uh, that we have. So again, that link will be provided to the participants after this uh, uh, after this webinar. Um, so I will. We have a mix of kind of what I would define commercial and technical questions. If you guys don't mind, I will start with the technical performance questions because it's um, making sure that we answer those. And uh, so there are. A few one. One is uh, from Lieb, and this I guess is for you, Donovan. So um, Lieb from Beta is asking if, uh, with regard to wet laid fiber, um, have we made a T paper structure which uh, replaces 100% the Abaca fiber contents? And if so, what is the basis uh, um, uh, weight? And would this NGO structure allow a user to run T packaging equipment faster? 
So question about, I don't know if you can see that on the screen, uh, Donovan, and if you can uh, answer. I don't see the question, but so what we've done in the wet laid space as far as tea bags, we've primarily, and a lot of it is up to the company producing the wet laid, uh, we supply fiber on the development side and eventually they will use a fiber supplier. Uh, so what we've been doing is mimicking what you would see as far as basis weights and the amount of fiber in that wet laid that they would typically have used with a polypropylene solution. So we've, and, and every tea bag company, it seems, runs their equipment at different speeds. And of course, everybody's uh, trying to push the envelope on speeds, but, but we're, we're able to run at conventional speeds that they would run the polypropylene at. So, um, so yeah, we're, we're able to, over time, drop right in. It, it took some time to develop a lot of the product and the process, and there may be some tweaking on uh, temperatures, for example, but, but uh, yeah, we're able to uh, drop into that equipment. Thanks, Donovan. Uh, so more question again, I'm first looking for the more uh, technical one, but I'll make sure we also answer the, the more, let's say, commercial related one. So uh, one, one, one that I was seeing, for example, for Kevin asking if uh, we only sell uh, neat polymer or if we also sell compound material. So talking about coffee, uh, as you've probably seen in uh, Joshua's uh, slides, uh, our focus is really thermoforming and our effort uh, has been all about uh, making sure that we could achieve high performance by converting NEAT and GEO into, uh, into a pod, into a capsule. Uh, there are different reasons for that, and uh, we could spend a few minutes about it, but uh, we really think that uh, from also from uh, a, a material perspective, it makes uh, way more sense uh, given the, the properties that NGO brings uh, to try to keep the formulation as as simple as possible. Uh, and so that's uh, the short answer will be we do only sell net, uh, net polymer in uh, for coffee applications. Um, again, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the different questions. Uh, one question from uh, Leila just got in if, uh, regarding leads. Maybe this is for you, Joshua, and it's about if we have a compostable barrier lead in development. Maybe you can uh, answer this one. Sure. Yeah, and, and thank you for the question. As, as Flavio mentioned earlier, uh, litting is such a, a very detailed topic that I think we are, hopefully our intention is to have a, a separate webinar specifically on litting or at least uh, something to go out on that later. Um, at the end of the day, we there are compostable barrier lids um, in development and even in the market today. Um, particularly, uh, you can look at companies. Um, for instance, Flavio mentioned uh, package or um, commercial products from Flow, like the Gia uh, capsule, using compostable barrier lids. So there there are some in the marketplace. Um, it is a highly uh, technical. Uh, area. Uh, so it's something we actively engage in and, and work with. Uh, they tend to be many more layers. Uh, for instance, we were talking about the pod that that has, uh, you know, a, an NGO sheath, a tie layer, and then the, the oxygen barrier. Um, typically, will there will be even more layers in that compostable barrier lid um, to really capture all the performance requirements uh, for that lidding. Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, um, I would add on the top of that, that again, depending on the format we're talking about, you know, high pressure, low pressure, and within high pressure, we have many different systems. Really, the requirements, as you said, are can be really different, but our partners, and we have a, a number of partners, so maybe I would suggest to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to share a list of, uh, of companies, of our partners that are uh, making uh, compostable leads for the different systems. Um, I see uh, 
quite a lot of uh, question uh, question sorry regarding also end of life so before we start the end of life topic that as i said at the beginning is kind of you know that the big thing it's performance and and sustainability so and uh, we knew that we would have got quite a lot of questions on it so we are already uh, organizing and we will be uh, communicating uh, via social media soon a, a new webinar specific about end of life so we will cover we will dedicate one hour only uh, about end of life topics so you will uh, uh, again, follow us on uh, on LinkedIn, Facebook, and all the social media, and you will get more about it. Uh, still, uh, I would like to try to to answer to some commercial question. I see one uh, that I I get every now and again is about potential supply shortage, and uh, one is I, I see at least a couple of of question about it. You say you call it the yeah, shortage of NGO PLA. There is shortage of PLA. No, it's not just a shortage of uh, NGO PLA. There, there has been shortage. Uh, as you know, in the last, I would say, couple of years, three years, really, the, the industry has got, let me say, kind of crazy. And uh, we have been in this business for 30 years, but I can say that the last three years uh, it's been pretty interesting from uh, a new development point of view. So. Uh, we as well as our competitors are uh, noticing uh, this uh, market shortage what we and, I, and now i'm talking about purely natural works we have been doing is focusing on some key markets and the reason why we are today here talking about coffee is because it's one of our key markets uh, you saw uh, a slide i presented earlier on when i was showing all the different some of the markets where we are today engaged and and those are a good example of markets where uh, we are really focusing and, and why i'm saying this trying to answer the shortage question is because we are moving volume from one market to the other meaning that we are moving volume from markets where we see less value uh, in uh, the material that we have been uh, supplying with than in others by value i mean for example the compostable attribute that we think is a unique attribute for the coffee pods so uh, as i was saying only a few years ago we were not present at all in uh, these markets uh, but our focusing is now uh, on some selected market. Another one is, for for example, infusion or, or 3D printing. So just to mention a few. So what's happening here is, uh, besides the fact that uh, there is, of course, today a limited amount of, uh, of uh, PLA available, we are focusing and making sure that uh, those companies that are developing uh, and are willing to develop performing uh, NGO pods uh, will be able to get uh, what uh, they're asking for again it's uh, we also know that the development time in this in this market is not short we're talking about often one two three years depending on what we are talking about and so uh, we think it's really important that uh, we really understand when uh, uh, the material is available and by when the material will be on the market so uh, again uh, reach out to us and uh, you will be surprised uh, to see the answer when it comes to market where we've been investing and uh, and developing solution for uh, i'll just a uh, quick time check we have another couple of minutes so probably this will give us time for another question and i see one from steve again i'm, I'm kind of giving priority to the technical one just because of the uh, it's a little bit more in topic but uh, steve is asking us about uh, nippon goes ag polymer i think joshua you were mentioning it and uh, the uh, the oxygen uh, barrier if you can mention something about it yeah, i was actually just typing an answer so i'll <laughs> for bringing it up i'll just uh, say it verbally so steve yeah thank you for that question um, so the G polymer from Nippon Gosai uh, is a uh, polyvinyl acetate based polymer, so PVOH. Uh, it is um, uh, it is a, a compostable product that um, that is fossil uh, based. Um, it is a used at, at you know of course very low percentages, but but then does um, degrade. Uh, it is um, the OTR is listed on the slides. I'm unfortunately hesitant to, to run back to the set of the slides and, and mess up the webinar, but um, these slides will be available at the conclusion of this presentation and you can definitely flip back. Um, I, I did list the, the OTR values for an NGO product that's that's co-extruded with the G polymer, um, as well as a polypropylene uh, co-extruded with EVOH uh, for your reference. 
Thanks, Joshua. Yeah, and uh, feel free again to reach out to us, and we'll be happy to provide also contacts of the companies we we named in the in the presentation. With that, again, I really would like to thank everybody again uh, for uh, for being here today for your questions. Uh, because of the period, I think we'll need to get used to this kind of interaction. So more webinars. Uh, please mm, send us uh, feedbacks. We are. I'm sure that we can do things better, but and thanks, thanks again for uh, for participating, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Thanks, Joshua, and and thanks, Donovan. I'll see you soon. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks Thank a lot for. Uh... Bye.